Hi, my name is Thomas Stark and I'm a dog trainer. Um, I've been training dogs since about 1998 and didn't do it as you know a job until about 2007. Um, I got into breeding and showing Rottweilers um, about 2007 and I've been doing it ever since. I learned a lot about dog behavior by watching Mama Dog with the puppies and with my own dogs I would prefer that they had manners as opposed to obedience. I didn't care whether my dog sat but I did care that my dog didn't rummage through the garbage can or you know bolt through doors or do a lot of the unwanted things that you know most dogs do. So I got into dog training and doing it professionally for a long time now and I decided to do this video to help other people understand about manners and basic dog behavior and how to address certain issues with your own dogs. Um, in this video you'll learn some basic commands and manners and how to address timing and corrections and when to do certain things that you need to do with your own dogs and understand the behavior of a dog. So enjoy the video. Dogs learn by triggers. This leads to that, this leads to that. If you're, you can think of yourself when you're feeding your dog at night, when you open that door to get the, the food bag, the dog gets excited because they know that this is gonna lead to them eating. Well, you have to think of that in your training as well. Uh, this behavior will lead to this result. If I squeak a tennis ball, that's gonna lead to me throwing it and him retrieving it. Example of a dog learning by triggers is if I tell him to touch something and his reward is to get the ball. So the only way he can get the ball is for him to touch the ball over there. So, by the touch. So the, the ball, touching the ball led to him getting the ball to retrieve. Was, and he'll do it on his own too, without me even having to say anything to him, because I've just taught him that. So for him to get the ball, he knows he's got to touch that. And I didn't even tell him that. So let's see if he'll do it again. He kept doing it until he got the response he wanted. So the trigger was for him to touch the ball to have a reward of getting the ball. Here, bring, out. Now if I stand still, So the reaction was touching the ball without you having to say anything. He's learned that touching this bowl will get the ball thrown to him. You need to focus on this is also in a negative way. If he, a dog hears the doorbell and it'll rush towards the door because it's been rewarded for that when you open the door and the neighbor pets your dog. Well, that's the trigger that led to this reward. So when you're training your dog, you need to understand that they live in the moment only. They only care about what happens right now. Not five minutes ago, not five minutes from now. They only care about the now. So if he focuses on me, I need to snap and then reward him for that. So if I say his name, Baja, I have an alert, an attentive dog. He knows that that's gonna lead to some other kind of direction that I have to give him. Baja. Boy. You don't want to get into missing your chances to reward. You have about 1.4 seconds to either correct your dog or reward your dog. If I tell him to sit and then I wait for five seconds and say good boy, he's not really sure of why, why he got rewarded. He may think he got rewarded for looking off at the people there. So, uh, Baja, there, that was the reward. You say yes, give his, give his reward. Dogs need stableness when they're training. So they need to have a calm, confident trainer. You don't need to get too abrasive with your dog or be too rough. You don't also need to let the dog make the decisions. Your dog has to have a leader. They make terrible leaders. To this day, I've yet to see him walk in a pet smart, walk right to the dog food and then to the register and then leave. It doesn't work that way. I'll be following him around the store while he sniffs every aisle. So dogs learn that this will lead to some kind of reward. For him, a ball is more exciting than food. I can put down a bowl of food and I can throw the ball, he's going to chase the ball. He doesn't care too much about the food, but he, he, most dogs are food driven more than they are ball driven. So 
when you're training, you use food every time. Every time your dog does something that you want in a young dog, you have to reward them every single time. They will begin to habituate if they don't get rewarded. It's like if you went to work and two weeks you didn't get a paycheck, you're not gonna show up for work that third week. You're gonna obviously go talk to your boss about why you weren't rewarded for your work. Dogs will always repeat a behavior that they've been rewarded for. If they find some chicken in the trash can, you can mark your words that every time that dog goes by the trash can, he's gonna sniff it to see if there's a chicken in there. He got rewarded for it. It doesn't matter if it's two years later, he will still go back and look for something that was in that trash can because he got it before. Also, when you train your dog, you shouldn't use one of these. This is a treat bag. Now, this will only make sure that the dog behaves while this is present. You need to know, the dog needs to know that the treats come from you or out of your pocket or from, that you're the source of treats. Don't carry clickers around and treat bags and leashes and all this other stuff because all that is is extra things that you have to have. When dogs learn, it's by marker words. Find a word that you're gonna use consistently. Um, a yes, a bravo, a good, whatever you want to use, but it has to be consistent. Every time your dog does something, that, needs, that marker word needs to come out. Don't change it. So if I do something, baja, yes. So that was my clicker word, was yes. He knows that that leads to a reward. So when, you, when you're training your dog, the marker word needs to come first, then the reward afterwards. So baja, baja, yes, then pet. So you have to mark the behavior, then you can pet afterwards. That doesn't confuse the dog, it lets the dog know that what you're wanting. Now dogs don't speak English. This dog in the whelping box, I didn't see mama dog teaching them a English lesson. Uh, they learn by body language, body postures. That's what dogs learn best. When two dogs meet each other, they don't talk. They read each other's eyes, ears, read their tail, read their body postures, whether they submit or whether they show dominance. They, they communicate by body postures. Dogs get about 80% of their information from your body language, 20% from your tone. So you have to be aware of what your body is doing when you're training your dog. You have to be consistent, you have to be reliable, and you have to pay attention to what your body postures are. I can tell him to sit, but give him the command for down and he will go down. Now, when your dog understands only body language compared with tone, it doesn't matter really what you say to your dog. So if I tell him, sit and he goes down this was the command for down if i tell him down and give him the command for sit down so the confusion for him was the body told him to do this well i told him sit down sit down so his body uh, my body language is telling him what to do not my what i'm telling him so if i tell him come stay stay Good. Sit. Orange. Blue. Green. Yellow. Black. Orange. Doesn't matter what you say to your dog. It's all about body language. Stay. It's all about body language with the dog. Your dog reads your body language. It can care less what you say to your dog. Now, we've all heard, had the friends that train their dogs in German, and they say that so nobody else can talk to their dog. That's not necessarily the truth. The reason dogs are trained in German or Czech or this kind of language is because they understand it better. English words carry the drow, drow gone. Sit, stay, or come. All these things change over tones, where in German it's more of a more of a stern to the point kind of language and it's all single tone. So if I say Platz, as opposed to down, it's more understandable to the dog to understand that kind of tone. Fuss, if I take him out, front, hey, 
sits, bleib. So if I put him in a stay over there and I want him to come, I'm not going to go, come. I'm going to go, here. Fuss. Nein, fuss. So now I have a dog that understood the tone a lot better, so he's more accurate at farther distances. Good boy, Platz. Bleib. Humanizing your dog will not work. I can't cuddle with him right now and then expect him to behave the rest of the day. I have to live in a dog's kind of frame of mind where they have to work for what they get. And anything that they do has to have some kind of result in the end. So if I'm doing rewards, that has to follow with a treat. If I'm doing corrections, it has to follow with some kind of correction. Uh, I don't feel that being you know, overly corrective to a dog works. I kind of I do what mama dog would do. And all she does is Rawr! That's about as big as of a correction as you'll ever see. You just, uh-uh, and then the dog understands what that is. I don't use no because no has too many different variations and tones. If I asked 10 people out here to say no, it would all sound different. If I'm upset, I'm gonna go, no. Now, if I'm trying to, if I caught it spur of the moment, I'm gonna go, no. Well, that's two different commands to a dog and it's gonna confuse them. So I just use, uh-uh. No matter what your mind frame is, you can say, uh-uh, and it'll work fine. And it's something you don't use all the time throughout the day, so it's not gonna be confusing to the dog. So my corrections are basically, uh-uh, and that's all there is to it. If you overcorrect a dog, it'll show you're unstable. And only humans follow unstable leaders. So you need to be stable and calm consistent and confident. So if I do a correction, uh -uh, that's all it needs to be. He'll get it, everything will be fine and you move on. You don't take your dog and put them in a crate for punishment. It's like when I was a kid, my parents told me to go to my bedroom to be for punishment. I was okay there. I had a TV, I had my baseball cards. It wasn't really a punishment. It was just somewhere else I had to go. So when you take your dog and put them in a crate for misbehaving in the house, all you did was reward them for that behavior. You said, here, this is how I want you to act and I'm gonna put you in your happy place. So when you're teaching your dog, understand that a correction needs to be short and smooth and then move on. Go on to the next thing, redirect and reward. When you think of timing, um, an example that I use to tell most of my clients is think of a red light. If you're driving a car and the light's green when it's approaching a traffic light, and then it turns yellow and you don't apply the brake, then it turns red and you decide to apply the brake, well, you're too late. You either ran the red light or you're in the middle of the intersection. So the way you transfer that to dogs is, if I tell him to sit, his sitting is a green light. Him getting up from the sit is a yellow light. Like this, that'd be the yellow light. And him standing completely up would be the red light. If I wanted him to stay here, I needed to correct him in that yellow light situation. So your timing, has to be that where you're catching the dog in the act of doing something. You'd apply the brake once you saw the yellow light so you'd be prepared to, prepared to stop. Timing is everything when you're correcting a dog. So he's in a sit now. If he were to get up, I'm gonna say uh-uh as he's getting up. That way he knows that I'm correcting him for the getting up. I'm not gonna say sit again if he's getting up from the sit because that would just confuse him of what sit means. So if he's here, ah, ah, ah. You see, uh-uh, tossed him to go back into the sit, not the sit. So if I go, okay, okay, uh-uh, and I don't have to say sit again. Just that first initial sit would make him sit, where the t time is him getting up and I'm giving the correction, he knows to go back into a sit. It's all about the timing and your corrections. Now, we've all had the dog that does something that we don't desire. We call those unwanted behaviors. When your dog does something that you don't want them to do, you need to remove those motivators and reinforce what you'd rather the dog do. Um, if the dog rushes the door when the doorbell rings, you have to show them what you'd rather them do instead. Maybe go to a bed or sit you know, away from the door and you control your space, but you have to redirect and reward an unwanted behavior. Baja. Here. Platz. Hey man, hey, how you doing? Hey, good to see you. Me too. I know one of behavior is when dogs bark when you go when you see a jogger or people walk by or they're walking by with another dog. Uh, to a dog, if they bark at them, the other thing goes away. So they're basically winning. It's like when the FedEx man rings your doorbell and the dog barks like crazy. What does the FedEx guy do? He walks away. The dog wins. 
So anytime this happens, you need to make sure that you stop this winning so the dog learns that it's not a beneficial thing. Um, I like to go through neighborhoods and if a dog rushes the fence, I'll just stand there. And the dog realizes that I'm not going anywhere and the dog usually will cart off. I do the same thing in the Humane Society when dogs bark at the gates. You can think of it like people walk by them all day and if they bark at them, they go away. So it just teaches the dog that if I bark at you, I win. So curbing the barking uh, obsessively is showing them that they're not gonna win from acting that way. Um, an easy way to fix barking is to teach a dog to bark so you can teach them not to bark. Baja, pass out, pass out, pass out, pass out, pass out, shh, down. So you can turn them off from the barking when they get barking and you can tell them that no bark, uh-uh, whatever you wanna do. But give out, give out, blive. So you can teach them when to bark and when not to bark. It's the easiest way to fix barking is to teach them to bark. If you have a dog that barks obsessively, you have to find out what the barking, what the cause of that barking is so you can address it and redirect and reward. If you have a dog that eats your food or sits at the dinner table or you know, does all these things begging for food, well, then you need to remove them, show them where you'd rather them be, and be consistent about it. You just can't tell a dog to do something once and expect them to keep doing it. You have to challenge them all over and over and over again. It may take 10 times, but you have to show them that that's what you want. We, we're from the microwave generation where we want things now. We want it now, now, now. Where a dog still lives in the ancient thing and they still takes a little while for them to process things. So, Jordan, I say go to the playground. And just like kids, you have to train them and be consistent. <laughs> Tell that's my child, I unwanted behavior of playing on the rocks and I told him what I'd rather him do over at the playground. Now, Couple other things, jumping. Jumping is a big one that I get calls on. I have this dog that jumps and I can't get them to stop. So I go over and the first thing they do when they get to the door is they open the door and they let their dog jump all over me and say, oh, he'll stop in a minute. Well, the owner is the leader of this dog. It's up to the owner to get control of their dog, pull them back, make sure that the owner of the house greets me first, then I'll greet the dog. But if not, if the dog rushes to the door and jumps on me, jumps on me, jumps on me, well, probably like everybody else that comes to the house, I'm gonna want to, I don't, but I'm gonna want to push the dog off of me or you know, start turn away. Well, all I've done theoretically is pet the dog. If I push this dog down, he doesn't discern the difference between pushing down and petting. The warm side of my hand touched the dog. So I just rewarded that dog for jumping up on me. Now, dogs jump on you so they can sniff your nose to your nose. And what happens is somebody along the lines pets the dog or says, oh, that's cute, hey and pet your dog, well they now have been rewarded for this behavior. A dog's gonna do repeated behavior they've been rewarded for. If it takes 40 times of them jumping on people and they get that one person that pets them to a dog that just told them that all I have to do is jump on 40, 40 times and I get petted once. So it's that mind frame of they'll keep doing things to get rewarded for it and when somebody reinforces that behavior then you've basically just created your dog to jump when you're trying to do the opposite. So you have to redirect and show the dog what you'd rather want. So what I do when I go to people's houses that have jumping dogs is I'll stand there. I'll cross my arms and I'll just wait till the dog quits. Ideally, I try not to let the dog's paws even get on me, but I'll just stand there until the dog quits. When the dog finally sits down, it may take a minute and a half, two minutes, but it will happen. And when the dog sits down, I pet the dog. Then I go back to this position and let the dog jump on me, jump on me, jump on me. And as soon as the dog stops, I'll pet him when it sits down. Every time I do this, I'm reinforcing the behavior of sitting on the ground, teaching the dog that if you sit on the ground, that's where you get the petting from. Not from jumping on me, I'll ignore you for that. I'll ignore, redirect, reward. What we're gonna do is we're gonna bring one of the cameramen in to assist because she won't jump on me because I've been training with her. But we're gonna see if she's gonna jump on him here. And then I'm gonna tell him what to do in the process of how to fix it. And then it'll show you guys on exactly what to do in this situation. All right, entice her to jump on you. Please.
Laney. 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 Okay, that's the jumping part. Now step on the leash with just enough space to where she can jump up. Right there, perfect. Now entice her again. Rainy. See, she's sat, so that's what we'd rather her do. See if you can entice her to jump on you, because I want to show this correction of... Laney. 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 All right, well, you get the, here's the end result. I guess this is what uh, would happen if you have a dog that does this and you're staying consistent with stepping on this leash or consistent with petting her when the butt hits the ground. This is one of those things that is easily fixed. Now, the ideal reason, I didn't mention this before, but the reason that dogs jump on you is because they want to smell your nose. And that's what a dog wants to do because that's how dogs meet. So that's what they do with us, but they can't reach our nose. So they feel the tendency to have to jump up to try to get to our nose. Well, in that process, somebody pets them for the dog jumping up on them and then they become a jumping dog. So you want to be able to make sure that the dog gets the idea that if they sit their butt on the ground, they'll get rewarded by a pet. Good girl. So an unwanted behavior can easily be fixed if you quit rewarding for it. My dog begs at the table. Well, it's because you gave turkey to the dog at the table. It's going to be rewarded for that behavior. If you give, people say, well, I don't give people food because it makes the dog beg. No, feeding the dog from the table makes the dog beg. You're actually making this dog in the same hierarchy as you because you're eating with the dog. Alphas eat for the dog. So you eat your dinner, then you feed the dog because that shows a proper hierarchy structure within your household. If you're feeding your dog from the table while you're eating, your dog, your dog believes it's on the same hierarchy as you and it doesn't really have to listen to you because it's ranked just as high as you are. When you're trying to take the leadership role over your dog, you should obviously walk through doorways first. You should be the first one on the lead. But another good trick is eating before the dog. Alphas always eat before the rest of the pack does. So what you want to do is let your dog see you like you're eating because the rest of the pack always watches the alpha eat. So you just act like you're eating something. Okay, and then you can show your dog eating. But that tells the dog that the hierarchy is understood of I eat first, you eat second. Be aware of the things that you're rewarding because every interaction with your dog is a training session. Whether it be just walking in the house when you get home from work. Well, you should ignore your dog when you walk in from work because if you acknowledge your dog every time you come in the house, you're basically creating a separation anxiety that you don't want to, you don't want to create. If I walk in the house and I say, hey boy, good, I missed you all day. Well, every time I walk out of that door, the dog's gonna wait for me to walk back through that door because it knows when, as soon as I walk through, it's party time. If you're leaving for work and you say, oh, bye, I'll see you later when I get home. Well, now you've built excitement in the dog and you've created this, this communication with your dog and then you walk out of the door. Leaving your dog in this frantic state like, hey, we were just a team a second ago and now you're gone. They'll sit there at the door, waiting on you to come back in. They hear your car pull in the driveway, go back in. When I walk in the door, my dog may lift his head, look at me and say, oh, he's home. That's what he does. He doesn't rush to me to come jump on me and say, hi, I miss you all day. I know people like that, but what you're doing is being unhealthy for the dog. You're creating a separation anxiety with your dog. Now, another unwanted behavior would be chewing things up in your house or um, you know, having free roam of your house and eating your coffee table. Well, in a young dog, you have to understand that you have a 10 to 15 year commitment. If for the first six months to a year, you allow this dog to do all these behaviors inside of a house, they're gonna think this is okay practice and for the next 15 years, this is the problem you're gonna have. It's very easy to train a dog, but it's very, very difficult to untrain a dog. So in the first year of a dog's life, you need to create a structure where they have boundaries and limitations and that they only get rewarded to go to this other area of the house. There's no need in the world for your dog to have free roam of your house. They're only gonna learn bad behaviors. If you're sitting in the living room and your dog's in the bathroom tearing up the paper towels, well, you don't know what's happening, but your dog's having a blast. So if you can't keep your eye on your dog, put them in a crate. Put them in their laundry room, wherever your place is that they go when you're not home. Uh, you can, a good judge of time is the five months to, is five to six hours in the crate. Six months is six to seven hours in the crate. Um, do not let your dog whine to be let out of the crate. If they whine for 20 minutes and you get, have enough of it and you go open that crate, all you've taught the dog is that if you whine for 20 minutes, I'll let you out of the crate. You have to be, let the dog be calm before you let them out of the crate. 
it's hard to deal with the first couple days. I understand that. But if you have a couple days versus 15 years, that couple days seems minute in, in the grand scheme of things. So spend those four days dealing with whiny dog. You know, start training your dog crate training on a Friday so you can sleep in on a Saturday or whatever, or go to the movies when you first put your dog in a crate or something so you don't have to hear the whining. But do not let the dog out of the crate if it's whining. If after two hours your dog starts whining in the crate, possibly has to go potty, take it outside, let it go potty, bring it right back in, put it back in the crate. Choice kennel. Cut, kennel. Cut. You really need to get in the habit of Bringing in from outside, put the dog directly in the crate. Bringing the dog in from outside, put him right in the crate. So they learn that when I'm in the house, or come in the house, I run straight to my crate. It makes things easier if it's raining outside, your dog walked through mud, to keep the dog from trapping mud through your house, on uh, jumping on the couch and doing all this stuff and really damaging things in your house by just being, you know, a wet, muddy dog. Another unwanted behavior would be marking. Male dogs, when they get a little older, will begin to start marking things. The best way to deal with this is pay attention to your young dog. If you see them sniffing around, sniffing around, and they're about to hike their leg, catch them in the act. The timing of corrections needs to be in the instance it's happening. If you have a dog that counter surfs and looks for food on the counters, you don't catch them in the act of them paws being on the counter, and then you say, uh-uh, off. That doesn't work. The dog's already been rewarded for being up on the counters. This already checks stuff out. So the real thing is, if the dog is creeping, and you see them kind of sniffing and looking up towards the counters, that's when you correct them, they're uh-uh. And then they stop and then you can snap them out of it and redirect them to what you want them to do. You have to catch them before they want to do something. If I see him look over that way and start to inch down, I'm gonna say uh-uh and catch him in the act of where he's thinking. After the fact isn't gonna work. I'm not really addressing the behavior I want him to stop. So you have to catch things in the act. Fixing unwanted behaviors is best done if your timing is on par. So if your dog is doing something wrong or about to do something wrong, feel free to correct them before they do it. They'll understand because it's in their mindset of thinking about it. If you see your dog starting to walk towards the trash can, hey, uh-uh, then they know what you're talking about and they won't go for the trash can. Socializing a dog is extremely, extremely, extremely important. It sets your dog up for the rest of his life. If you don't socialize your young dog, then every time they see something that they haven't seen before, they won't really know how to address it. Now, I've socialized him like crazy. He's just been a part of my dog training and been a, a show dog, and he's just been around a lot of certain different situations. He's been to dog shows all over this country. He's been to dog shows in Europe. Um, when people walk by, he's pretty much oblivious to anybody that walks by. He might look at them like this, but nothing new to him, because when he was socialized, he knows how to deal with every action. So it sets your dog up for how to deal with things later in life. It helps them make the right decision of what they should do. With my puppies and their young litter, I have a rule of seven, where I have dogs walk on seven different surfaces, grass, brick, cement, rocks, sand, water, all kinds of different st stimuli on their feet. I have them meet seven different types of people, women, men, different races, kids, different ages, size groups different places. I take them in a shopping cart through the grocery store or Home Depot. So all these different things while they're young really won't be that big of a deal later. You can see how he just addresses people as they walk by and it's not really a big deal to him. This is why socializing your dog is very important to where he's not on leash. I don't have to do anything. He's okay with what's going on. If I told him to get up and let's go, he's going to do that because that's his job. That's what he's supposed to do. So not socializing your dog is going to create a dog who every time it sees a dog it's going to freak out or every time it sees a kid it's going to want to jump on them or you know it gets freaked out by thunderstorms or this and that. They have to be socialized. Show them everything you can while they're young so when they're older it's not that big of a deal. All right, so socializing, an example would be uh, the Volkswagen Beetle. When the new Volkswagen Beetle came out, we were all like, wow, you watch it drive by and it'd be like the first time you ever saw it and it was just the coolest thing when you saw them. They were rare to see, so every time you saw one, it was like, wow. Well, now the thing's been out for several, several years and we see one and you probably can't even remember the last time you saw one. I don't remember the last time I saw one because it's not that big of a deal. 
Think of that as socialization to your dog. The more Volkswagen Beetles they see, the less likely they care about them later. Now, when your dog meets another dog, you have to understand that they have a communication going on. They read each other's tails, they read each other's ears, eyes. You're gonna have a confident dog and you're gonna have an insecure dog, or you might have two confident dogs. Now, if right now he sees another dog coming up and you see his body posture, it's just normal. And the dog walks by, the other dog's oblivious to it. And then he's on, on with it. He doesn't, it's no big deal anymore. Done said. So when two dogs meet, you have to understand that the tail tells all. When you're meeting another dog with your dog, you need to pay attention to your dog. Keep it behind you. Look at the other dog. What's going on? Are the ears forward and alert? Are they pinned back? It's fear. Is the tail straight up? If it's straight up, that's a very dominant standpoint. And if it's rapid like this, it's what I call the cobra. And that's a dangerous part. Don't let your dog meet another dog if the tail's doing this. If the tail's out and swinging like this, that's okay. If the tail's way down and tucked below its legs, that's a, that's a very insecure dog and you probably don't want your dog to meet that dog. It could be a problem. Dogs sniff each other's butts uh, is a, some, a behavior we see all the time. But if you notice, if you have several dogs within your household, they don't sniff each other's butts often. People think that this is their way of saying hello, this is, you know, blah, 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 blah. That's not the case. This goes back to an instinct to the wolf pack. Um, if I'm a lone wolf and I'm trying to join another wolf pack, well, they're gonna wanna to smell me and see where I rank in my pack to figure out where they rank, I would rank in their pack. So when a dog or wolf sniffs my butt or a dog sniffs another's butt, they're just checking out what the nutrient value is. Because the alpha obviously gets the highest level of nutrition because they're the only breeding pair, the alpha male and alpha female are the only breeding pair in a wolf pack. So they have to have the best nutrition. So when another wolf smells another wolf's butt or a dog smells another dog's butt, they're trying to see where they rank in their pack. That's why your insecure dogs always cover their scent with their tail blocking that scent because they know they're a low level pack member and don't want anybody else to know it. A confident dog will stand up and definitely allow all the other dogs to smell their butt because he knows he's confident. So when a dog smells another dog's butt, all it is is seeing where that dog ranks in its pack and see where it would fit in in my pack. Now with a household with five dogs, you don't see them sniff each other's butts because they obviously know where they rank in the pack. So when you see dogs sniff each other's butts, understand that that's not a handshake, that's not a greeting. They're trying to see where that other dog ranks in the pack. Your dog doesn't need to meet every single dog it sees. Dogs can't compartmentalize friendships. So they don't have friends. What they do know is that I smelled noses with this dog and it was a friendly scent. And that wasn't necessarily a unfriendly scent. So when dogs come by and you have the dog that has his tail up and alert, then you know that that dog is a confident dog and it's okay to approach that dog, but wait until the tail comes down more low and swings more centralized because now you're gonna have a more positive interaction. If, for any instance, your dog has a problem with another dog and some kind of altercation ensues. Say this dog had a problem with a dog in this village and another dog jumped on my dog. Well, now this dog sees that this place, he's gonna to have to be on the offensive now, where if he sees a dog, he's gonna automatically get up and be on the offensive. Kind of like if the neighbor walked out of the house and punched you in the face. The next day, if the neighbor started walking towards you, you're gonna have a different reaction. Now when you're doing training sessions with your dog, keep them short and sweet. Don't overtrain your dog. They'll get bored and they'll won't see training as something fun. Keep it short, keep it sweet. Two to three minutes here, three to four minutes there, and then go about your day. If you keep it short, and you end at the peak of excitement, then that shows the dog that this is fun. So while he's in his most exciting mode in training, end it. Throw him the ball, always end on a positive note. If you're training something new, say a proper heel and healing position, and the dog's just not getting it, ask for a sit, end training. Move on, don't make the training too much overbearing on the dog, they need to see that it's fun. Play with your dog after you do a training session, so they can see that training leads to fun. Training should not be a, a job or this bad thing that the dog has to do. Training is a skill, like playing golf or tennis. You know, your, your training sessions need to be precise, they need to have a certain focus, and then move on. When you think of timing, um, an example that I use to tell most of my clients is, think of a red light. If you're driving a car and the light's green when it's approaching a traffic light, and then it turns yellow and you don't apply the brake, 
then it turns red and you decide to apply the brake, well, you're too late. You either ran the red light or you're in the middle of the intersection. So the way you transfer that to dogs is, if I tell him to sit, his sitting is a green light. Him getting up from the sit is a yellow light. Like this, that'd be the yellow light. And him standing completely up would be the red light. If I wanted him to stay here, I needed to correct him in that yellow light situation. So your timing has to be that where you're catching the dog in the act of doing something. You'd apply the brake once you saw the yellow light so you'd be prepared to, prepared to stop. Timing is everything when you're correcting a dog. So he's in a sit now. If he were to get up, I'm gonna say, uh-uh, as he's getting up. That way he knows that I'm correcting him for the getting up. I'm not gonna say sit again if he's getting up from the sit because that would just confuse him of what sit means. So if he's here, uh, uh, uh. You see, uh-uh, tossed him to go back into the sit, not the sit. So if I go, okay, okay, uh-uh, and I don't have to say sit again. Just that first initial sit would make him sit, where the t time is him getting up and I'm giving the correction, he knows to go back into a sit. It's all about the timing in your corrections. All right, when you're teaching any kind of commands, um, I like to use what's called luring, so I can have the dog follow. Sits. The dog will follow my hand wherever I go if I have a treat, here. And when you're teaching sit, you just put it to their nose and lure them back like this to where the hand signal is this. Well, here, okay. So I can lure him into a sit. You can also teach jump that way too, is it's just luring them around. So they follow this piece. So here. So you can see I'm not having to say anything to the dog. But then when you get here, here, okay. Baja. When you lure them into the sit, sit. You say sit right when their butt hits the ground, as opposed to saying it first. So the dog can associate butt hitting the ground with the tone sit. Here, okay. Lure, sit. What you want to do after you've taught the sit is a release command. He'll stay in that seated position. No, uh, 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 sits. And you see there, as he's starting to get up, that's about the red light, yellow light, green light I was talking about, where he'll correct himself if he comes out of that sit before I say it's okay. So when I do the release, I'm going to come back. Uh, uh, Good. So I do the release, I come back, okay, and then I can release them. Now when you do the release, the only thing that needs to be moving on your body is your lips. Don't go like this, don't jump like this or blow like this. Any one of those motions will be a hand signal for that dog to break that stay or that sit stay while you're doing the release. So you want to be, able to be sure that when you're releasing, your body is completely still like this, and then you say, okay, that's the only thing that needs to move. Rewarding your dog doesn't always necessarily have to come from food. You can use a ball to reward your dogs. You can use toys, anything else. He's actually more ball driven than he is food driven. So I can put down a bowl of food, tell him, okay, okay. He's more interested in the ball. If I'm using just treats and they're present, he's not really enthused about treats so much as he is like ball drive. So when I break out a ball, A little bit different energy level in the dog now. Plats. See how much faster he is when the ball is present? This is fun for him. The ball is his ultimate reward. The food, he could care less about the food. It's the ball that drives this dog. So your own dogs might be different. They might not be as food motivated as they are toy motivated. For him, sits, foos. It's much more ball oriented for him. Bravo. In training, I get a lot of questions that ask me, when can we start getting rid of treats? Baja, here. You can start stringing things together. Like, instead of going sit, release, you get a reward, come, you get a reward, and giving rewards every time, once they learn the behavior, you can string several of them together. When I work him on just basic stuff, I'll string a bunch of commands together, then reward him afterwards. Baja, here. You can kind of think of it like a paycheck. Um, I don't get paid every time I do something at work. Baja, here. I don't get paid every time I do something at work. I get paid at the end of the work week. So, for instance, of a dog, come here. Sits, plats, sits, here. Blame. Here, plats. 
here, Fuss. and then close. Then you can have the reward afterwards. So you string a bunch of commands together, it makes them work harder for what they're trying, their goal of trying to get the reward. So you can string all these together and make it one training session and then have a reward. Training session, then reward. Um, I only encourage this after the dog has learned the behaviors. I use a treat, food, food reward for accuracy. Dogs have an instinct of survival to, to work for food. Um, and then I'll use a ball for speed. I can get my dog to move a lot faster if a ball is present because they see that as play. They never see food as play, but they do that for accuracy. A lot of times I have people call me and they just have problems with their dogs pulling on the leash. Um, they can't have pleasant walks because their dog is dragging them around and doing those other things. Um, first and foremost, you need to not use a retractable collar. If you use a retractable collar, you're just teaching the dog that they can pull. Um, they can go any direction that they want and you're just following your dog. Um, the walk is not physically exhausting to a dog. It's mentally exhausting. It's actually a time for bonding between the dog and the handler, and it's just a short stint to a walk. I own a doggy daycare and I watch dogs run around for 10 hours at full speed. Then it tells me that walks are meaningless to the dogs. But how you start a walk is very important. I would never just start a walk where I just go, okay, and he just goes. Basically, I've given him the free range of having first goes. So, when I start a walk, hey, uh-uh, sits. I make the dog sit. I make sure I have a leash, a loose leash. If this leash is tight, I'm telling that dog to pull. I'm putting tension on this dog, and, he's, and it causes him to pull. But if I have it loose, uh-uh, here. Sits. Hey, sits. If I have it loose, then when I start off, I'm at a loose point, and this is a reward to the dog for this to be loose. So when I start off, okay, here, uh-uh, here, stop. This stays loose the entire time. If it were to get tight, I bring him back to the spot that I started with. Sits. Then have him sit again. You want to give a verbal command before they get to the end, where if he goes, out, uh-uh, and then I pull him back. So that uh-uh will teach him that he's getting too far ahead. Hey, sits. So when you start a walk, okay, uh-uh, easy. See, the uh-uh slowed him down. Baja, this way, this way, hey, this way. Notice how he's following me with a loose leash. And then when I stop, he should stop. All loose leash, it never got tight. If this gets tight, you do not walk forward. You take your walk. Come on. And it should stay loose at all times. This dog knows that I'm the leader at this point. So whatever I do, he follows, but this leash never gets tight. If this gets tight, over and over I tell people, if it gets tight, stop walking. If he's walking and this leash is tight, he's being rewarded for having a tight leash. So if I have this tight, let's go. Uh-uh. Bring. Yeah. Good. That way it stays loose. Sits. Good boy. Now, the other part of this is if I'm walking forward and he tends to pull me and I stop to go, uh uh, come back, sits. If I stop to go, then I'm taking the leadership from him. Ideally, you want to see your dog look up at you before you, uh, before you walk, but that's later and that's a respect kind of thing. <laughs> it's not a dog show, buddy. It's not a dog show. Sits. Good boy. Sits. Bravo. So, what you want to do in a situation where the dog is, say, stopping to sniff something, and it's sniffing something, sniffing something. Well, a lot of owners will just follow their dog around and let them sniff, sniff, sniff what they need to sniff, and then they, the dog decides when it's done and ready to go. Like here, I'm allowing him to sniff, 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 but for me, I, I have what's called a seven second rule. If he hasn't peed or done something in seven seconds, I start to walk again myself. So it's me that's making the decision to when to start and when to stop the walk. 
You also don't need to, while you're walking your dog, you don't need to walk like this because this makes yourself look weak. You have one dog, when two dogs meet each other, you have one dog that bows up and you have one dog that comes to the side and cowers down. Well, if I'm walking him like this, I look weak to my dog. He's on a leash. I know he's on a leash. So when I walk him, I just go. And then if I go this way, I just go. Keep my shoulders back with confidence and just go so the dog will follow a confident leader, okay? This is not something that's very hard to do, but it's a matter of consistency. If he gets ahead of me by pulling, you stop. You bring him back, Baja. Make him sit. Then you start your walk again, okay. And you be the one that goes. If he gets ahead of you, you pull back and you start again. Sit. Now I like to do what's called a pull up sit, um, where if he's not sitting, and it does get easier as you do it to where you barely pull up and the dog sits. But a pull up sit is just barely pulling the front feet off the ground until they automatically, it's a natural reaction to go into a sit. Then you get the loose leash. It's very important that when you're doing the pull up sit, that as he pulls up and as he sits, this leash has to go loose as soon as he sits. That way he can associate butt on the ground with loose leash. If you keep holding it tight, it'll confuse the dog. So when you're doing a pull up sit, drop it. So it's loose at the same time. If he pops up from this sit, when I've done a pull up sit, you go right back into it and pull him up and sit again, get the leash loose. Then you can start the walk. Okay. Start the walk again. If he gets hit, uh-uh, pull, and bring him back into position. Pull up, sit. Good. And start to walk off. Good practice is putting the leash in your pocket. That way you can't keep a tight leash. If the leash comes out of your pocket, he's pulling too much, okay? Baja. Okay. Come on. Baja. Good boy. Come on. And talk some words of encouragement to your dog. If your dog's doing what you're asking them, then let them know it. Let them know, good boy. Don't just expect them to do this for nothing. Walking on a leash or walking with a pack, dogs are going to challenge position at all times. So if I walk with two dogs, you'll notice that they'll chest each other for position. Well, you as the dog's alpha and as the leader, you need to be in front of your, uh, uh, need to be in front, uh, 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 need to be in front of your dog as you're walking. Hey, here, bash, yeah. So if I'm in front of him, then I'm the, I'm the clear cut leader of the walk. Good boy, good boy. Hey, babe. Good boy. And notice he sat on his own when he came to position because we've done these little things. I've done a pull-up sit and he knows when I stop, he's got to sit. Does this take long to train? No. If you were consistent enough, you might not make it past your mailbox, but if you're consistent enough, you'll have your dog loosely walking in no time. This is my local pet store here on St. Simons Island. It's Pet Exchange. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is what you're getting when you buy your dog food. Uh, the dog food companies have done an awesome job of marketing. Uh, 50 years ago, you'd never see any of this. Um, but after a lot of time, then these companies like Science Diet and Purina and Ukanuba, all of them have started to be the front runners of this marketing ploy. Um, they try to say that Science Diet is healthy, balanced nutrition. Well, you need to understand what the nutrition parts are. And to do that, you need to read the ingredients, the quality of the ingredients, how much you feed, and the cost of the bag. I'm not going to tell you to go buy an $80 bag of dog food. What I am telling you is that you need to do your own research, read the dog foods. All right, this is Science Diet. The ingredients of this advanced fitness bag are chicken. Now, chicken being the first ingredient is, it's kind of a, um, it's a marketing ploy. Because if you know anything about chicken, well, after it's cooked, you lose about 95% of it. So chicken being the first ingredient in this dog food bag is not really the first ingredient because you're gonna lose 95% of it. So the next ingredient is obviously gonna be your number one ingredient. And that would be whole grain wheat, then you have brewer's rice, you have whole grain sorghum, then you have corn gluten meal, whole grain corn, and then chicken meal. So you get through about five or six ingredients before you even get to a protein in this bag of dog food. 
You wonder why your dog's always hungry. Well, they're eating a bunch of corn and wheat, so they're not getting any nutrition from it. If you have overweight dogs, it can be attributed to this because they can't digest half the stuff that's in here. Now, when you look at this, I'm going to feed a 100 pound dog six and a quarter cups of this. Six and a quarter cups. So, and this is $12.99 for this bag of dog food. So, at $13 a bag for five pound bag, I'm feeding six cups. Now, you go down the line of some other good foods. You have Nutro, and then you have these. These are the higher grade foods that he has in his store. And I'm gonna swap and just poke out this Blue Wilderness. Okay, this is $18.99 a bag for four and a half pounds. So, a couple dollars more than that. Now, your ingredients on this are deboned chicken, chicken meal, turkey meal, peas, tapioca starch, tomato pomace, and so on and so forth. So you start getting these higher proteins in the first couple ingredients of this. Now I'm gonna feed a 100 pound dog four and a half cups of this as opposed to six cups of that. So if you're doing your math, you're buying a bag of corn here for $13 and you're buying some decent protein for your dog and this for $19. So when you get down to the nitty gritty, you're actually paying more to have a worse food. Then you come into something like this. This is from, it's a really good food. It comes from uh, Wisconsin, originally from Canada, I believe. Um, the ingredients are this. This is the Game Bird Recipe dog food. Now, when you're looking at the ingredients, you need to know what, what proteins are. Turkey meal and chicken meal, those are the proteins that you want to see. You don't want to see chicken byproduct, you don't want to see chicken byproduct meal, and you don't want to see chicken. If you see chicken, you want to see chicken meal as the next ingredient because that's going to be your highest uh, concentrated protein. All right, this one has, it's $15.99. So right here, we're $2 more than the science diet for a four pound bag. You're going to feed three and a half cups of this versus six and a half of that. So about half. And the ingredients of this are duck, duck meal, peas, turkey, potatoes, pea protein, dried tomato pomace, pea flour, dried whole egg, quail, chicken meal, chicken fat, salmon oil, sweet potatoes, chicken, pheasant, cheese, flaxseed, carrots, broccoli, cauliflower, apples, celery, parsley, lettuce, spinach, chicken cartilage, potassium chloride, blueberries, cranberries. The reason you hear all these fruits and veggies is they're for antioxidant purposes. Um, ideally, when you're feeding a dog, say a raw diet of a 100 pound dog, you're gonna feed two pounds of food. And in that two pounds of food, you're only going to feed about a tablespoon of fruits and veggies. So when you see those ingredients, think of it as about being a tablespoon per, per, per serving. Now this is what I feed myself. It's Origin. This is about the highest quality food you can get. Now it's pricier. This one's $26 a bag for five pounds. But I'm only going to feed two and a half cups. So I feed three times less than that. So for this, I'd be paying $39 for a bag of this, which is $26. So I'm paying more for the junkier food. Now the ingredients read like this on this one. Now this may be too hard for some newer dogs to this kind of food to handle. So you want to kind of wean them onto the, the richness of this. Now the ingredients of this are gonna be boneless Angus beef, boneless wild boar, boneless lamb, beef liver, boneless pork, pork liver, whole herring, lamb liver, beef meal, lamb meal, herring meal, salmon meal, Pollock meal, beef tripe, bison, lamb fat, whole egg, red lettuce, chickpeas, green peas, yellow peas. You get the idea. So you're buying a lot of proteins, which, you know, the dogs are carnivores, so they need that kind of different protein mix in their foods. Um, when you're feeding, going from a worse food to a better food, uh, you don't really need to wean them on. But if you're going to a really rich food, like an origin or a from, then you're going to want to slowly wean them on because it, they're going to re, be releasing the toxins from this other junk food. Um, you might have a smell to your dog for the first couple of days. Um, that's the toxins being pushed out of the body. And you'll notice you can't get a dog to be overweight when you're feeding a good food like this. I could lock one of my dogs in a crate for a month and feed them this and they still wouldn't gain any weight. Um, it, they absorb all the nutrients. You have to understand that a dog's digestive system isn't like ours. Um, theirs is about 16 hours long. So they can't, if you have that expired steak in your fridge, give it to your dog. It's not gonna harm them. They can't get E. coli, they can't get salmonella. They just basically pass it through their body. They can't digest it, it doesn't, it, or they can't, it can't sustain in the stomach for too long because their digestive system is so short. So 
when you're doing these kind of things, you know, look at your ingredients. I don't care what, you know, my clients feed as long as they're looking at the ingredients, feeding a quality food that's going to be beneficial to their dogs. It's a good website to look at that's an independent website. It's not, you know, lobbied by any of the dog food companies. It's dogfoodadvisor.com. They'll break down your dog food. They'll show you how many stars your dog food is. They'll break down every ingredient, show why it's beneficial, so why it's not beneficial. And then you can make your own decision of what food fits in your budget. But look at the amounts of food that you feed. Feed the cups. Look at the cups. Look at uh, how much the bags are. Look at the quality of the ingredients. Uh, I'm not saying go out and feed the best food you can, but just find something that's in your budget that's healthy for your dog. So when you're feeding this type of food, you'll also notice that if you have a dog that used to hound down its food, like it's going out of style, like they can't just get enough of it. Well, that's probably because it's being fed low quality nutrition. When you start feeding a better food, you'll notice that your dog slows down. They'll even possibly leave some kibble in the bowl. Don't think of it as your dog doesn't like the food. Think of it as, oh, my dog's got the amount of nutrition that it needs and it doesn't need to you know, gorge into more food. It's gonna leave some in the, in the bowl because it's content with that nutrition. The, also, uh, the other thing is, don't necessarily just go by, it says four and a half cups. Don't just feed four and a half cups every single day. If it's raining and your dog hasn't done anything all day, you can wean that down a couple, you know, a little bit to maybe half. Now, if you take your dog to the beach like I do pretty regularly, I give them a little bit more dog food um, just to, you know, match their level of energy so they can replenish those, you know, much needed vitamins and nutrients. Um, if you take your dog and do a lot of work with them, uh, you know, you're doing a working dog. Like if you have herding dogs or protection dogs or things like this, you're going to obviously need to feed them higher quality nutrition. Now, if you give your dog table scraps or something like that from after you've eaten dinner and you put it in their bowl, don't give the amount of dog food that you normally would. Take that into consideration that you've given them, you know, uh, four ounces of a steak. Take that into consideration when you go to feed that night that you've already given so much of a nutrition or so much of a, a protein or some kind of food so you're not overfeeding your dogs. Okay. You can build your focus also by waiting for the dog to make eye contact with me. I don't necessarily have to put the treat to his nose every time if I know he's got it. But I will hold my arm out like this and he's focused on the treat. But notice how he makes eye contact with me. And he's not focused on the treat. Here. If I hold the treat out, he'll follow it out, but then comes to make eye contact with me. Yes, good. And then I'll reward him for that. So you can build that focus where it comes around and his focus more centralized on you. A proper sit doesn't mean the dog can just go sit and then get up whenever he wants. The sit should be released. Everything should be released. So if I tell this dog, sits, I basically don't have to tell him anything else until I give him the permission to get up. The sit meant sit. Doesn't mean sit and you can pop up whenever you want. If you do this properly with a proper release, then it's basically your, your stay command. I didn't tell him to stay, but he knows to stay there until I release him. Okay. So. I bring him back to the position. Bice. Here. Bice. Sit. Good. So I didn't tell him to stay or anything. I just told him to sit. Now, when you release the dog, the only thing that needs to be moving when you release is your lips. If I do this and try to release him, then this is what's releasing him, not, me, not my voice. So when you release him, you need to be completely still. Okay and then release him to where he can get his treat. This is ideally your stay command. Stay to me is just a reinforcement word. So when I tell my dog to sit, I don't have to tell him to stay. But if I do, like stay. If I do, then he knows he's gonna be there for a while. And I can go on wherever I need to go. Okay. So a good sit with release is a good function for your stay command. Now, and you're down with release. Down is a multi-step multi-step command. Baja here. To where when I tell him to down, it's, it's, it takes a while to get there. So first, you have them in a sit, then you lure them slowly. So they go in a down, then you only address down when their belly is on the ground. At first, don't say down because it's not going to work. You need to lure the dog into the down, associate the word down with belly hitting the ground. Now the second part of this 
sits. The second part of a down is getting your body erect. We don't need to be the person that goes down and has to touch the floor every time we wanted our dog to go down. Baja, hit. We don't want to go all the way to the ground. So ideally, sits. You point to the ground with your hand signal. Down. Now the second he gets down, you need to throw the treat between his legs. You want to reward in the direction that the dog is going. Sits. So I tell him, down. Throw the treat between his legs. So you see how his head goes down looking for a treat? It's better than me going right here. Here. Sit. Sits. So this time, when I go down, I'm going to reward from my hand. Watch his body posture as I reward from my hand. Down. If I do this, now look, he's coming, he has to come out of the down for me to be able to reward him. So if I do this, down, and I throw the treat between his legs, his head goes down. That's the second part. The third part, Baja, sits, is now we've conditioned everything else. Down, he knows to go down, and he's looking for his treat, but there's not one. Then I can get back here, okay, and release him. Now, when you have a command that's like, leave it, uh, it means leave it alone. You can never, ever, ever have whatever object you're telling them to leave. It can be a dead bird, it can be your sunglasses, socks, another dog, a person, whatever it is, leave it means leave it alone. So if I throw this down, leave it, he should know he can't have that. All right, when you're teaching the leave it command, you have two objects. These she can have, this she cannot have. But I'm gonna entice her, Luke, with this one here. And she's gonna keep looking at it because that's what she's gonna do, but my hand's covering it. Now what I'm gonna teach her is that this stuff over here is she can have. The food under my hand, she can't. Good. Then I'm gonna mark that. I'll let her sniff this again. I'll put it down, cover my hand over it. Now she knows she can get food over here. Yes, good. So it's only a matter of time before she quits going for this and only goes for this. Leave it. Yes, good. Leave it. Yes, good. Leave it. Yes, good. All right, another command is a take it command. Bajah here. Your dog shouldn't just be taking things out of your hand when they choose to. You should be able to put the food right in their face and then avoid it because you haven't given them the okay to go for it. You should be able to put, this is filet mignon steak. It's very, you know, enticing to the dog. But I'll put it right in his face and he won't go for it. Now, if your dog's head moves forward for this, you're going to pull up and pull away and say, uh-uh, offer it again. If they go forward again, pull up. You might have to do it about 50 times before they realize that making their head stop moving will make your hand stop moving. So if his head were to move forward right now, I'm going to pull away. Okay? Uh-uh. Just like that. Okay? Okay. Uh-uh. See, he knows it, so this is confusing to him. So now, I'm going to give him the command to, okay, he can take it. Okay. So he can only have food when you tell him it's okay. Now a drop it command, it's kind of hard to train because once they grip whatever they have and then you offer them food in replacement of it, they typically won't go back for this. So it's a kind of an ongoing process to train a drop it. Now, if, you, if your dog gets something in your house, say it's a sock, and you just take it from them and don't replace it with something, they're gonna end up getting resource guarding behaviors where if you take your sock for them enough times, they're gonna growl at you once, and then you're probably gonna jump back because you've never heard your dog growl at you before. Well, this goes along with the dog learning a challenge. So if I challenge you by growling because you have something, Baja, hit, then, and I win, well that teaches me that all I have to do is growl and you'll leave me alone. So you always have to replace the object with something else. So if I give him this, Baja, Bring, and then I put a treat to his nose, nah, -uh. bring, bring, sits. If I put the treat to his nose and say drop it, he'll drop that object and then he can have this object. So drop it is kind of as you go, but this will teach the dog that if I tell him drop it and I make this motion towards his hand, even though I don't have anything in my hand, he still thinks there is because he's been conditioned to it, all right? Good boy.
Now the cone command is just a reinforcement word of focus, like I explained earlier, to where if I yell his name, he's going to come, but my reinforcement word is going to be come. Now the biggest thing with come is when the dog is almost to me, I'm going to kneel down. I didn't say come. I'm going to kneel down and crouch and let the dog come into me, hit, hit, and come into me, and now I'm going to take my other hand and put it on the collar. Because if you have to say come to your dog, you need to be able to grab them. So when they come to you, come, hit, come to you like this, and that way you can get a hold of them. Now I'll show come at a distance, hit, hit, hit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call his name, and then when he's almost to me, I'm going to reinforce the come command. Baja! Come! Good boy! Good boy! And he needs to get a big reward for that. Don't say come and your dog come to you and you go, good boy. Because most people's command for come is really treat or cookie or something because every time they said that to their dog, then they've been rewarded for it. So anytime come comes out of your mouth, make sure you reward your dog. I don't care how close you are to the dog, if it's a foot away and you say come here and the dog comes, you have to acknowledge that behavior. If you want a good come command, they have to be rewarded every single time you say come. Sit gets a cracker, come and call gets filet mignon. All right, the stay command is also just a reinforcement word for a good sit or a down with release. So when I tell my dog to stay, my hand signal is going to be like this to stay. Baja, sits, stay. So he'll stay there until I release him. To start this off, you want to get your dog used to having feet moved around them. I do what's called around the world, where I'll take one step to the side, come back, one step to the side, come back, one step like this, come back, one step like this, come back. That teaches the dog that different body postures are going to happen with them staying in this sit position, or this stay position. So when I do this, you can then take two steps for one, over, one, over, a complete step away, a complete step away. This helps the dog understand what they're wanting because you're not going too far away at first. Now in the stay command, if I teach him stay, Baja here, sits, this spot is his stay position. If I go and off away and he breaks that stay, here, sit, and he moved up a little bit, to him it's confusing because he thinks that he can now move forward. So if I'm teaching him stay from that original box, I'm going to come back and bring him here, front, sits, stay, to the original stay position. So he doesn't learn that inching up will get him farther into the area. He has to learn his boundaries. The boundaries are this line here that he can't cross. If he crosses it and you're teaching stay, you have to bring them back to the original starting point. It'll confuse them if you don't. Don't do a stay command like this and then just walk off from your dog really fast when you're teaching them because that body language is going to create them to break the stay. Here, Bush. Life. So when you're teaching the stay, start off slow and walk away. Hey, stay. And then walk away at a normal pace. Okay. Sit. Platz. Fuss. That way the dog understands that you'll be coming back, but the stay, whether it be from a sit, you can even do a stand stay. Here, come here. It's blive. Where the dog will stay standing. Platz. All the way down. Now a lot of people ask me, what's the difference between stay and wait? I just look at it like this. Considering I train my dogs in German, Bleib doesn't change across the two. But for purposes that y'all understand, stay basically means stay here until you're released. Wait means wait here until I get back. So if I'm walking to the mailbox, I'm going to have my dog wait at the front door. I'll go to the mailbox. I'll come back and release them. Stay means I'm going to stay, put my dog at stay at the front door. When I get to the mailbox, I'm going to call them to me. So, thighs are here. Here, sits, stay. Okay, and then I'm gonna release him. Now, the difference between a weight would be this. Yeah, front, 
sits, wait. Same hand signal and everything. But this time, I'm going to walk away from my dog. Then I'm going to go back. Good boy, stay. Okay, and that's a wait. That's the difference between it.